My name is Dan Clark. I'm a staff engineer for International Systems Engineering and my purpose today is to introduce you to some of the basic radio communication systems that are in use. Also, I'd like to acquaint you with some of the common terms used and give you a brief introduction to some of the equipment. There can be many types of communication systems, but the number of them in practical use is rather limited. And this is due mostly, I think, to legal limitations. The number of available frequencies might be limited, or a certain type of repeater station may not be permitted. Mobile radio systems all began in the 1920s, right along with AM broadcasting. As a matter of fact, the early police radio systems used AM broadcast. Their transmitters were multiple kilowatt AM broadcast transmitters, and they would talk out to the cars, but the cars had no transmitter to talk back. This large box here is a receiver only. So they would give the police a handful of nickels, and this is what pay telephones cost in those days, and they'd have to find a telephone in order to talk back to their base. Later on, when mobile transmitters were installed in cars, uh, the systems were referred to as two-way radio systems. And this was to distinguish them from the old one-way systems. And the name has remained ever since. People still refer to our present products as two-way radio. There are many types of mobiles that we use, and these vary in the power of the transmitter. Uh, they might vary in the features available, and also the specifications. You'll find some small ones that may be mounted under the dash or instrument panel of the car, and you'll find some others that uh, would be mounted in the luggage compartment, in the trunk, or perhaps be mounted under the seat. There are several types of base stations that are used, and a popular type is this COMPA station, COMPA cabinet station. These are compact uh, base station cabinets, and uh, some of them are small enough to fit alongside a desk, and others with uh, additional options uh, can be uh, somewhat larger. They can also be stacked vertically in order to save space in a crowded equipment room. Smaller stations are available that uh, will fit on a desktop, in the case of this desk, tra desk track here, and the type of control is important. The one you see here is a local control station. All the controls, the, the volume, squelch control, frequency switch perhaps, are on the base station front panel, right in front of the operator. Mid-remote or extended local uh, stations might be located in another room or perhaps in another part of the building and controlled by a short cable or wire line from a desk set. And as you see, this desk set looks something like a telephone. Total remote control has a station that's uh, completely operated at the end of a dedicated telephone line, normally leased from the local telephone company. And most all functions of the base station can be tr controlled by sending signals down the wire line, right along with the voice audio. Sending the voice audio and the control signals uh, down this line is a console, a control console and it's usually equipped with a microphone and all the necessary control switches. Portables, like mobiles, are made in different sizes, different capabilities, and some may be capable of switching as, much as, as many as 99 frequencies. Others may be just built for one or two. The same model portable may be equipped with uh, different size batteries. A small battery like this uh, will operate to perhaps eight hours on a charge, but if the transmitter is going to be very heavily used during the day, then a larger battery might be necessary to last uh, eight hours. The acquired uh, transmitter power, of course, determines the battery size also. Antennas are important in portable operation, and, well, really none of them are, are as efficient as a mobile antenna. The larger portable antennas uh, are best. They provide the, the greatest range. The smallest sizes, however, are much more convenient to carry. Pocket pagers also have antennas that are much less efficient than a mobile, and these antenna factors have to be taken into account when designing a radio system. The frequency of operation is sometimes op determined by technical factors, but more often the choice is determined by what's legally available. 30 to 50 megahertz is VHF low band. It has the characteristics of long distance, 
and uh, it does have rather high electrical noise levels, unfortunately. A big disadvantage is that it is affected by what's called skip interference. Long distance propagation from stations many hundreds or even thousands of miles away. And these come in with very high signal strengths, uh, enough to disrupt operations in a business. Low band is uh, least affected by hills, mountains, or uh, other terrain features. Mid band, 66 to 88 megahertz, is used for mobile radio in some European countries and their former colonies. Most commercial users are in VHF high band, 150 to 174 megahertz. Uh, we do make some equipment in the 130 uh, megahertz range for government and military users. High band has good coverage. It has lower electrical noise levels and uh, it is uh, practical to use some antenna gain. There is a band uh, around 280 megahertz uh, which is used for paging in some Asian countries and we have made some pagers in this range also. Anything from 30 to 300 megahertz is considered VHF. And this is why we refer to high band and low band uh, to distinguish the two. UHF is defined as 300 to 3000 megahertz. And there are two bands for mobile radio in this region. They're usually referred to by frequency. The 450 megahertz band and the 800 megahertz band. 450 to 470 has most of the equipment that we make, but there is a band around 406 to 420 megahertz, which uh, we have equipment for as well, and it's normally used by government and military users. In the USA, some equipment is made in the 470 to 512 megahertz range, uh, which is used uh, on a shared basis with television channels in certain cities. 450 megahertz has less range, very low electrical noise levels, and it is possible to use antenna gain, additional antenna gain. 450 megahertz is more affected by terrain and heavy tree cover than the lower frequency bands. The bands near 800 megahertz and 900 megahertz have less range, but they're very good for city coverage. They're also less used at the present time, less occupied in many areas, and so are more available. Any frequencies above 1000 megahertz are normally classed as microwave. Microwave is mostly used for point-to-point -point communications, and the bands are near 2 gigahertz, 6 gigahertz, 12 gigahertz, 18, and 23 gigahertz. Microwave channels can carry many simultaneous telephone channels in either analog or digital form. The advantages to FM in comparison with AM for mobile radio became well known about 40 years ago. It's useful to mention some of them since it helps to explain some of the basic concepts and terms. Briefly stated, the advantages are signal to noise improvement, the capture effect, better flutter performance, and an improved squelch circuit. First, the signal to noise improvement shown on this chart here. Uh, you'll see that there's three lines and the bottom one corresponds to amplitude modulation or AM and as you see this is a plot of signal to noise versus signal input on the horizontal axis. And as the signal strength increases uh, you'll notice that the signal to noise uh, increases on AM but notice the FM line, the one in the middle here. There is a threshold after which the signal to noise improvement is much greater. The third line up at the top here uh, represents wideband FM, which might be used for FM broadcasting. Their transmitters are deviated plus or minus 75 kilohertz under modulation, so the improvement is much greater. But you'll notice there's a threshold here a rather high threshold, and it requires much more signal strength to provide this additional signal to noise improvement. The capture effect is the ability of a stronger signal to overcome a weaker signal on the same channel. So if the weaker signal is interference, this capture effect can help. You will hear only the stronger desired signal. I should tell you that uh, occasionally the weaker signal is the desired one, 
Uh, but, well, that happens. Better flutter performance is essential in rapidly varying signal strengths that uh, we deal with in uh, mobile radio, VHF and UHF. Uh, it's caused by signal reflections, multipath propagation. And this creates areas of high and low signal strength. And as a mobile travels through these uh, areas, uh, this creates a fluttering effect, especially in low signal strength areas. The rate to flutter depends on how fast the, travel, the car is traveling through uh, these high and low signal strength regions. Also, the frequencies uh, band de determines this as well. Theoretically, the signal minimums occur every half a wavelength at the operating frequency. So at 150 megahertz, uh, you'll get a minimum every three feet or every one meter of distance that the car travels. When the signal dips below the threshold, a burst of noise results. And as the car moves through these signal minimums, you'll get a series of noise bursts. And this creates the fluttery effect. The advantage of FM in such a situation is the voice does not change in its level as with the varying signal strength. With AM, it will do this. And with other forms of voice modulation, like single sideband, it will be very difficult to understand under these conditions. There's not much that can be done about multipath. The usual procedure is designed for much higher signal strength. And if the average signal strength is way above the receiver threshold, and by a certain margin, then the signal will go below the threshold for only short periods of time. The use of FM allows us to use a more effective squelch circuit. Squelch is the circuit that quiets the receiver when there's no signal being received. And without this, there'd be a loud rushing or roaring noise that would be heard in the loudspeaker. And you don't want to sit in a car or an office all day and listen to that. So when a carrier signal is received, this noise quiets down. The more signal, the quieter it becomes. And this quieting characteristic on FM is used to operate the squelch circuit. Uh, there's a circuit that opens an audio gate in the receiver. And with full noise level, uh, no signal coming in at all, this gate is closed. And the receiver loudspeaker is disabled. When the circuit uh, detects just a few dB of quieting, very weak signal, uh, the gate opens and the signal is heard in the loudspeaker. And this is referred to as noise squelch or carrier squelch. There's a certain point on this quieting characteristics that uh, is of special interest to us. And this is where the noise quiets down by 20 dB from the no signal value. This 20 dB quieting point is often used to check the sensitivity of the receiver. And the amount of signal strength necessary to produce this 20 dB of quieting is measured with a calibrated signal generator. And typically, it requires something like a half a microvolt for 20 dB of quieting. There are other types of squelch available uh, on Motorola receivers. And another type is called Motorola Private Line, or PL. All receivers in a PL system are equipped with an audio tone decoder that responds to a single low frequency tone. All transmitters, both bass and mobile, will send this continuous low frequency, low level tone along with the voice. If you don't have a Motorola receiver, it sounds something like this. I'm also going to be around for 44 cents each cars today. The Motorola receiver will filter out the hum or buzz in the background so you don't hear it in the loudspeaker. The receiver squelch will open only if the proper code is detected. If it's the wrong frequency tone or no tone at all that's received, the receiver just stays quiet. And when different users must operate on the same frequency, they can be using different PL tones and they'll hear only their own units using the correct PL. They won't hear the other users on the channel with different tones or perhaps no tones at all. Unless, of course, they purposely disable the PL squelch, which is done with a switch on the front panel. In this case, they'll hear everything. And it's necessary to disable the PL squelch in order to monitor the channel before you transmit. You don't want to interfere with the conversation that's in progress. There is another type of squelch, uh, similar to uh, PL, which uses a repeated digital pattern. And this is sent right along with the voice. It's sent uh, at a very low digital rate, and it's filtered out at the receiver, so you don't hear it along with the voice. The receiver looks for a digital pattern on the received signal. 
And if it matches what's programmed into the receiver, then the loudspeaker opens and allows the signal to be heard. If there's no digital signal, no digital pattern, or perhaps an incorrect pattern, the receiver simply stays quiet. This is Motorola's DPL, or digital private line. Much of the communication transmitted over radio these days is voice analog, but that's changing. Digital is becoming much more widely used. It's now being used to transmit to, to certain types of pocket pagers. The transmitter frequency is varied, plus or minus four kilohertz, uh, to transmit binary zeros, binary ones, and the message. Special arrangements in the base station are necessary to do this. Astro is a new method for sending binary or, and digital voice, digitized voice, over the radio. The transmitter frequency is shifted to different values, and each stands for a sequence of binary bits. For example, a plus 0.6 kilohertz shift causes the receiver to, to send a binary zero followed by a binary one. If the transmitter frequency is shifted plus 1.8 kilohertz, it causes the receiver to respond with a binary zero followed by a binary zero. With this method, a high-speed binary can be sent over a narrowband radio channel. The multipath fades that I mentioned previously can seriously affect paging digital transmission. So Motorola uses an arrangement of digital signaling called GOLE, sequential coding, and you may see it abbreviated uh, GSC. It has many extra binary bits for error detection and error correction, and there's also some repetition of the message bits. And these measures make the transmission much more resistant to multipath fades that are normally encountered in VHF or UHF radio. We do provide other schemes for paging on request, but we do recommend the Golay. Poxhag is another digital method that is often used as well. Another example of uh, digital transmission is the StatAlert product. This product uh, sends prearranged messages, so-called CAN messages, from the mobile back to the base station. The mobile operator selects a push button on the control head, which sends a message to the dispatcher. And you might hear two digital bursts over the radio. One is the mobile sending its message. The other is the base station acknowledging it. The message might mean uh, in service. Uh, the message might uh, mean uh, out of service. Could be uh, at the scene. Or it might be an emergency message, any prearranged message. The dispatcher has a display on which the car number that's calling in is uh, displayed, and it also shows what message was sent. A short burst of uh, digital transmission at the beginning of the, the voice message will display the car number to the dispatcher. Another digital product is the KDT equipment. Uh, these initials stand for Keyboard Data Terminal. It's actually a computer terminal that's installed in the mobile and it communicates in short digital bursts through the mobile radio to and from the base station. Another popular product converts voice audio into a digital bit stream. This is essentially a scrambler device that's built into each radio. Uh, the name of this product is SecureNet, or DVP. DVP stands for Digital Voice Protection. After the binary bits are scrambled, the resulting modulation sounds just like noise. It's a rushing and roaring noise, just like a receiver without an incoming signal. You can't even tell if there's a voice uh, in it at all. It's completely scrambled. A receiver with the proper code can restructure the binary information and convert it to the bitstream, convert this uh, resulting bitstream back to voice. SecureNet is available on some, but not all, Motorola mobiles portables, and base stations as well. This completes the first portion of our basic systems course.